Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Personalization Outbreak Podcast, where we will explore the power of resilience and personal growth in the face of adversity with our guest, Mark DeBellis. Now, Mark has a broad experience in top tier corporate marketing positions with expertise in consumer behavior, product, and service marketing as both a practitioner and an instructor. Mark also actively serves as a mentor for both youth and young professionals. He teaches what he calls possibility thinking. See, Mark believes that adversity is a gift. He shares a wealth of experience and wisdom on the show. So please join me as Mark shares his remarkable journey of overcoming personal challenges and finding strength in the midst of uncertainty. Mark's inspiring story uncovers the five pillars of strength that have guided him through difficult times, from faith and family to finance, fellowship, and fun. Mark reveals the essential elements that have propelled him forward and helped shape his fulfilling life. Now, before we get started, please click the like button below, share it with your colleagues, and subscribe to our YouTube channel and social media, at Glenn Yopis. Let's get started. You are listening to Personalization Outbreak, a podcast about the collapse of traditional corporate standards in today's more personalized world. I'm Glenn Yopis. I'm a leadership strategist, author, contributor to Forbes, and founder of the Leadership in the Age of Personalization movement. On this show, I'm interviewing executives across multiple sectors to find out how the balance between standardization and personalization can exist. Mark, I'm so honored to have you on the show today. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Glenn. It's just an absolute pleasure to be part of this with you. You know, we go back a ways, and uh, this uh, journey has just been been wonderful. I'm happy to be on this side of the desk talking to you in this capacity. Oh, Mark, I'm loving it. Well, on that note, I want to make sure that our uh, our viewers on YouTube and our listeners, um, that this means a lot to me. I mean, Mark uh, became a mentor of mine early in my career, and his impact and influence continues uh, to fuel my life, both personally and professionally. It's just great to have you, Mark. Talk about how life comes around in full circle, huh? Thank you, Glenn. My pleasure. Joy to know you. (laughs) Ah, Mark. So here's the question, Mark. Let's get started with the one I think we all want to know the answer to. Why do we need more great encouragers like you in the world? I mean, I don't have to explain, just, you know, we're at, during these unsettled times where, you know, people are grasping, but I'm not sure that they know what they're grasping for. So why do we all need a great encourager in our life? Well, we all have the power to be a great encourager. In fact, um, everybody really has just the, the opportunity daily truthfully, to be able to be an encourager to anybody at any level. I think, you know, it's something that we <clears throat> seem to be uh, judicious with instead of being a little bit more open at the risk of it being seeming trite or in, in, uh, insincere. But I've seen that uh, people will rise to the level that you expect of them and encouraging them and giving them the faith, and the confidence uh, to uh, fill, their, fill their heart with uh, generally means uh, a greater out, outcome uh, or likelihood uh, that they'll, they'll get closer to their goal. Uh, sometimes they just need that uh, friendly person looking over their shoulder, and, uh, that encouragement, sharing their vision. Um, you know, so much of life is really about putting, putting the work in. Uh, we have a tendency to forget that. And, um, inspiring people while they're in that journey, while they're in the process of trying to build something or move towards something. It's just the fuel they need to continue. So uh, I think we we can all just keep that in mind as we look for opportunities to lift up everybody in, in your circle and influence, no matter their role or position. Well, much like you did with me early in my life, Mark. And, you know, today, uh, just getting somebody to believe in you is so important, especially now that we're feeling all this um, uncertainty, but 
we feel as if we're dealing with more adversity than yeah. ever before. And I know that this topic about adversity means a lot to you in helping people reach their full pot potential. So what exactly is the gift of Adversity Project? I know you just recently started this and you're well on your way to uh, helping millions of people throughout the world. So, so tell us, what, what is the gift of adversity? If I can help one, I'd, be, I'd feel successful. Well, truthfully, it started with me looking back Glenn, from where I am now and understanding where those true opportunities of my life were to grow and where, where the skill set came from. Nothing really comes from uh, an easy path. And uh, today we seem to think that is an option. and It really shouldn't be. So I began to really look at that fairly intently. And uh, what I've seen is that, um, and what I'm trying to do with this website is for people to share their journeys with each other in a way that inspires everybody towards the accomplishment and overcoming that individual adverse situation. So, you know, we, we see a lot written. There's certainly stories everywhere about um, people that have accomplished great things. But what about the average person that's just getting through life? You know, a simple adverse circumstance can change their world. And yet, they push through it. They find ways to not only overcome that, but use that as fuel in their own life to build confidence and courage. And I see that as an opportunity. We have things like Facebook today and other social media that allows people to share. But this option also allows people to share it without acknowledging or um, uh, sharing their identity. Because sometimes it may be an embarrassing circumstance, but yet it's valuable to share with others so others can learn from. It. So that's the essence of what I'm trying to do. My site should be up soon. And within it, I'll have places for people to share, people to get encouragement, people to seek um, coaching if they need it, and find other resources, other forms of motivation to help them get through whatever that struggle is. Well, you know, Mark, you, when I said millions of people and you said, hey, I, be successful if I had two, um, you know, you just need one because what they do with what you have can actually produce the million, right? Because this is a perpetual cycle. Sure. I mean, when you learn the cycle of adversity and the power it actually can bring to you, that's when you begin to start sharing more stories about how we've overcome it. Now, if adversity is a good thing, which I know you believe to be true, how come we do everything in our power to avoid it? Well, a big part of that is the fact that it's the human condition. You know, we as a, a society have, throughout our history found ways to do things easier, found ways to overcome um, obstacles. So that's just built into our DNA. Like, uh, you know, I don't think that's a bad thing necessarily. If you think about the things that we've been able to um, squeeze out of our day-to-day -day life, you know, certain um, risks from uh, driving, you know, safer equipment, safer uh, products. Those are all things that have been uh, sort of weaned out of our culture. But the downside, I think, of removing too much adversity, and I, it's one thing, say, for a product or a, a vocation, but um, life itself needs to have some adversity. So we don't want to um, pull adversity out of uh, our, our children, for instance. You know, we want people to be able to rise to vacation and stretch and, and strive. So, you know, today, <clears throat> you know, our values have shifted tremendously as a country. Things have become so easy for everybody. Um, we virtually have um, everything at our disposal without having to work too hard. And, you know, that's uh, the gift of our, uh, our advanced society, but also it's uh, a challenge that, you know, we have to ask ourselves, how do we, how do we read back in, you know, to some extent, the fire and hunger and things that uh, you get while you're on that road to accomplishing those things? Like, you know, you, you look at our situation as a society today, no generation has probably had so much uh, wealth in front of it, yet uh, the reaction to that or the product of that has been this real oversight 
that we've had as parents and as overseers of children, they've really been um, sort of had this weird form of protectionism over them for their entire lives, unlike any other generation. And today yet, after all of that love and nurturing and caring and oversight, we still have an extremely high, probably the highest it's ever been suicide rate for young people and depression. You know? And so we have to ask ourselves, well, why, you know, why if we give them all of these things and all this love and all this attention and affection and oversight and everything that they could possibly want for, why do we have that happening? You know, well, that makes no sense. And I think what it just says is that we are, you know, we're the, we are the best educated, at certainly, but we may not be the most mature now. And that's a, a, a question that we have to ask ourselves as a society. And I have to share with you, Glenn, um, this story. Because I think we can learn a lot from nature. Excuse me here. I'm driving to work one day. I only work a few minutes away from my house. And I see a, a bird that's been hit by a car. Just happened, must have just happened. And there's a little chick right next to it. So mommy bird and baby bird right there in the middle of the street. The mom is, is dead. And so I pull over and I grab the little bird. And, I, you know, otherwise a local cat might find it pretty quickly or another bird. But it was vulnerable. So I took it home, put it in a box, took a picture of it, said I'll, you know, come back at lunch and, and uh, look in on the bird. And so I uh, began to kind of, Go through the process. What do I do with this bird? You know, should I put it, keep it at the house? Should I feed it? Should I? What should I do? Part of me wanted to keep it, you know, as a pet of sorts. And I realized, uh, well, you know, I probably may may not be a high percentage uh, outcome. So I started calling places around, and they asked me to send a picture of the bird. Long story short, I found uh, someone who said, "Oh, that's a barn swallow. That's a that's a protected species." Uh, you need to turn that into the proper rescue organization. So I made another dozen calls. Long story short, I found a rescuer up in San Dimas, about 50 miles from our house. Jump in the car with the wife, drive up to San Dimas to turn over this little bird. And as we talked, you know, he was very um, knowledgeable and very insightful. And, and, and I asked him about, you know, can these birds be, be kept as pets or anything? Well, aside from the fact that it's a protected species, it's he said, no, what I do with these birds, I take these birds and I teach them how to compete in the environment that they're going to be in so that they can live. Because if you don't teach them to compete, to compete for food, for space, for mate, they won't live. They may be alive, but they won't live. And that little notion, you know, has weighed on me because Nature teaches us so much that we, you know, sometimes ignore or think perhaps we're above. And um, so that little bird always pops in my head. I wonder how he's doing now. But the point is, we, there's nothing wrong with giving our, our young people more of those kinds of challenges to help them grow those skills, to be more competitive and more ready for the world today. I mean, social scientists today say, yes, we're the most educated, the most wealthy uh, generation ever, but we are probably the most immature because we haven't needed to address some of these skills. We've lived in a wonderful period of time, but life isn't always like that. So it's one of those things I reflect on is, is were the tides to change and we would go through some really difficult times as a society, as a as a uh, country, how could we respond? Are we, are we strong enough, tough enough, you know, and ready for those kinds of things? Um, well, well, I think this is the point, Mark, is that part of the gift of adversity is it prepares us to be more resilient. And, you know, I think we've all seen, whether it's through the pandemic or other episodes that have happened recently, here in the U.S. and throughout the world is that some people just don't know how to respond when that adversity strikes. And right. you know, that's why during the pandemic, it was always about the, the front line, you know, the, the first responders. Why? Because they deal with adversity every single day. They know how to pivot on a dime, while those that don't have that experience often are waiting for someone to tell them what to do. So I... I 
So I don't know. Can you create a connection here between resilience and, and the gift of adversity, Mark? Yeah, I think um, one thing that is a famous quote that's worth committing to memory is prepare the child for the road. You can't prepare the road for the child. You hmm. think about the ways in which we try to protect uh, everything from any adverse circumstance. But um, it, it, in doing that, there is such a demand for having it your own way in life versus being able to adjust to the circumstance. And I, I think we see that a lot today where the expectation must be my way as a young or adult or a, a citizen as opposed to community way or the way it's been and are the ways to adjust our expectation for the good of, of uh, society. So it's uh, the resilience, like anything worth um, uh, rising to, comes from overcoming those challenges. Confidence, resilience, um, courage, those aren't things that you can bestow on people. You have to have them work towards those things. And they, they gain those as a product of it. Well, Mark, I think if I could just jump in here, Mark, because I think you've touched something and, and I know that uh, I think this is where the conversation is really going to take a whole other level, Mark. I mean, I'm listening to you. I'm, I'm looking at you uh, if, I'm, if, if I'm watching on YouTube and, and I'm asking myself, well, who gives you permission to talk about adversity? I mean, you look like you're all buttoned up, you know, highly successful executive. But I think that uh, while that may be true, um, I think there's a backstory here too, right? I mean, you've had a lot of adversity. Uh, and I don't know if you'd like to share it. If not, I completely understand. But I, I, I think that, you know, the level of adversity that you encountered early in your life, I mean, that's not just shaped who you've become, but why you're so passionate about creating this platform about the gift of adversity? Well, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of wounds uh, there that um, I've worked hard to kind of overcome. But the bottom line is I had a very atypical uh, childhood, very chaotic. I was the oldest and uh, parents were divorced and we, we had just periods of our existence that uh, we were without a lot. In fact, most things. And, uh, I had to really learn how to be creative and how to how to push through um, a lot of things as a 14, 15 year old, 16 year old shouldn't have to worry about. But things like having a roof over our head, having food to eat, <clears throat> getting by with our wits. And we had a very loving uh, parental relationship, but we just didn't have practical uh, Know, skills to manage life. So we, yours truly was doing some really uh, unusual things at the age of 15 when I should have been out playing basketball with my buddies and driving my family across the country to Texas with, in a beat up car, uh, you know, with no driver's license and, and uh, back actually. So just little things. Um, I know how to turn the, uh, the gas back on when the gas company turns it off. So. Um, things that you wouldn't ask your kids to do, but need to do to survive in what was a very uh, awkward time and awkward period. So I feel extremely blessed <clears throat> that my life went down the right road because it could have gone different, different directions pretty easily. And so I'm thankful for that because that adversity for me was a way to just grow in maturity. Um, didn't ask for it, didn't expect it, just the cards that were dealt. That's how life works sometimes. So when I became a young adult, and this is why I really encourage people and young, young people in particular to take on that tough assignment, lean into the challenges because those are differentiating factors for you as a person. You know, just to, to say that you had just the typical, uh, you know, typical childhood upbringing is nice and it's interesting. But were you able to grow 
differently than everybody else on the planet as a result. And for uh, really with God's grace, I think I was able to take that uh, period of time and use it as fuel. So for me, I didn't expect to get out of uh, into college. I didn't even think about college. It was really more about getting to the next day sometime next week. Uh, but yet I did. And um, I did that through uh, some very fortunate things in my life, having great friends, being inspired and being encouraged a lot and taking the risk, which scared me to death uh, because that was very out of, out of my comfort zone, out of the expectation. It wasn't discussed. It wasn't, wasn't a natural progression of my life. So for me, it was a very scary proposition. But it was one that, that I blossomed within. And it, as an encourager, we talked about that. Encouragement you know, gives you the confidence to take the first step and hopefully continue those steps as you build more and more confidence and courage in, in your journey and walk, whatever that looks like. So go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. I, I just, uh, it's a, um, it's a, a something that, and I will share this with you, talking to my parents, my mother in particular, the most loving parent and God-loving individual in our later years. And I, she said, I really am sorry that you kids went through what you went through. I said, you know, this was the greatest gift. You didn't know it maybe at the time, but it was the greatest gift you could have ever given. Because from that, were it not for that, I would not be where I am. And yeah. I want you to know that I love you for it. And so what a way to come full circle, you know, uh, with it. And then again, as we talk, the reflection on all of those things just come back to that strengthening the child, strengthening the individual, be comfortable with adversity, overcome it, move forward in spite of it. You know, Mark, I uh, appreciate you sharing that. I, I know that uh, we didn't probably plan on that. And, but as I continued listening to you, I, I just try to put myself in the audience shoes and it says, you know, why would he think that adversity is a gift? I think they'd understand now. <laughs> yeah. And uh, not just that, it's just that, you know, when you mention ideal family, I mean, what does that mean anymore? I mean, today there we, we've come to the realization that we all have problems and not that we didn't know that before. But I think people are they believe that now. Right. Because, you know, the packaging on the outside can be deceiving oftentimes. and especially uh, with youth, right? I mean, uh, you know, you talked about the, the, the suicide rates, the mental health struggles. I mean, uh, again, I can't get into the details, but there's a high school right near where you're at, Mark, where they had, you know, eight suicides in the last, you know, uh, two years. I mean, this is, fortunately, doesn't seem like it's going away. And so why, why do you think that dealing uh, with adversity, much like, today's youth is, um, why can, how can you deal it with it in, in positive ways? And, and if you can maybe give us like two or three tips, because I think right now uh, in this dialogue, people want to know from just your learnings and your experiences now that people you know, know you a lot better than they did at the beginning of the show. Uh, what, what can you share? Because remember, you, you had a choice to make uh, in your journey. And of course, you've had many as you've you know, created a beautiful family, two incredible uh, daughters. And then, you know, now you're a grandfather with uh, more grandkids on the way. Right, right. Uh, what, 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 are, what are some positive ways that people could approach adversity? Yeah, well, I, I would uh, be lying if I said I knew this at the time I was facing adversity, but, you know, reflection in time is a benefit. So I, I am um, fortunate as I look at, okay, well, how did I get this? What were the things and decisions that I made? Um, and I shared this journey, by the way, with a group of men uh, that I see on a regular basis. And I, you know, 
painstakingly try to figure that thing, that very thing out. And I really found that there's five key things for me that were my pillars, you know, that were my, my uh, sources of strength that have allowed me to move forward in life. And um, the first one is faith. Um, <clears throat> I don't think it matters what faith you are, but as long as you have faith, believe that you're on earth for a purpose. I believe in uh, Christian, I believe in God's uh, commandments, love God and love people. And, uh, but having that faith gives you ongoing strength. Having family, my family means the world to me, so they help me through times when things are tough, and hopefully I, I help them. Uh, finance is the, is the third thing. I, I want to talk about that. because I'm not, It's not a financial seminar or anything we're talking about. But what can really derail your world and create lots of adversity that you, know, you shouldn't have to deal with is just a general a lack of appreciation for financial decision, you mm -hmm. know. And in finance, I'm calling my financial world my job too, because that's where my finances come from. We've always strived to live below our means. Um, you know, that's just been our style, and you know, it served us very well. We're not uh, running in. You know, people aren't chasing us looking for money. We're not uh, uh, <clears throat> wondering when the next, fearing the next bill that through the door and so on. So really take the time at a young age to understand how all of that works. Of so many don't. Um, and then fun is the other like pillar of my world. I have some fun things that I wouldn't be the same without. My fitness focus, my music. I love music as you know of the playing in band and I that is a big part of now who I am and everybody needs to have that. In their life, so what's what's fun for you? Um, and then fellowship and friends. I think having friends, Glenn, you've been an awesome friend. And I'm going to steal something that you shared uh, in one of your books about the a friend and the value or the quality of that friend. You know, friends can be different. There's different friends for different seasons. But are your friends lifting you up? Are you growing with them? Are they helping make you better? Or, or the opposite? So I had some very good friends when I was very young going through those difficult times that accepted me for who I am and encouraged me to continue to seek more um, growth, personal growth, and, uh, go to college, all those things that I just didn't think were part of my script. And so the value of a friend is is priceless and being a good friend you know is the return you must make it as well be a good friend find good having those people in your life that can help help you through the tough time to be able to sit with them and get to get reflect with them and help them uh, as well that's what really makes life worth living have those kinds of influence like go through all the time and the good times I love them, Mark. Let's go through them again real quick, right? Faith. Your faith, your family, your finances, fun, and fellowship or friends. Having those five things, for me, helped make life complete. And now grandchildren. Nope. That's it. That doesn't rhyme with it. Of course. With of course. You know, Mark, <laughs> as we wrap it up and I start thinking about uh, those points, and I love them. If we mismanage them, they create adversity. And um, if we manage them, they can help either prevent or help us during times of adversity. Oh, no uh, doubt. There's, there, there's so many uh, interconnection points there. And, and uh, you know, and, and fundamentally, if I, I'm going to wrap it up with one more. Uh, and you've done this so well today is uh, when you have those, when you have those points, you now have a foundation upon which to build your life, uh, to make good decisions, and ultimately find uh, a sense of fulfillment and purpose. Um, and I think the beautiful part of your message today is that not only is adversity a gift, it should also be viewed as your best friend. Because in the end, 
can't run away from it. Um, and maybe we don't encourage it, uh, encourage people to experience it enough. And I think that's the, the beauty here is it. And, and that's what caught my attention. Wow. To see adversity as a gift. But as I hear your message even more, it's, it's, it needs to be viewed as our, you know, one of our best friends because yeah. it's through that journey of encountering it and navigating through it that really enriches us and allows us to become the people uh, that we can be. And uh, but so, Mark, I'm so grateful uh, for your time today. I, I think it's opened all of our eyes uh, to recognize that, you know, even today, right, we're going through a lot of challenges in society and business all over the world. I mean, clearly, uh, we're going through a through a, a massive reset. Mm -hmm. But what it's done, it's brought us closer to some adversities that maybe, as you said, we should be leaning into uh, and moving towards rather than running away from. Uh, so as we close, Mark, any final comments, uh, maybe, maybe a, another nugget of wisdom before we close? Okay, I've got, I've got one for you that's stuck in my head from uh, a trip I made. Have you ever done whitewater rafting? Oh, yeah. Okay, so when you're whitewater rafting, you know, there's an element of danger. Life's dangerous. And so is whitewater rafting. And uh, in the, in, in the uh, speech before we took off uh, on the rafts, you know, we got safety equipment, helmets, and everything else. And, and the guides are explaining how we're going to sit and paddle and everything. You're going to help us get through these currents and everything, like life, right? But one thing that stuck in my head is the, the saying, he said, if you go overboard, you must be an active participant in your own rescue. I'll never forget that. And how often do we get in a circumstance that mm. we become our own rescuer? And so it's uh, maybe life is like a whitewater raft, and sometimes there's a, a cool uh, a cool ride. Sometimes it's a little bit more uh, challenging, but you know we have to be doing the things that will help us. To create our own our own rescue, uh, own successful rescue. I love that story, Mark, and you know it reminds me of the many times you were there for me uh, throughout the adversities I have faced as a as an entrepreneur, uh, things that have happened in my life, and um, so I'm living proof that the things that you stand for uh, not only are real, uh, but they work. Mark, I love you, man. Thanks for your time. This All has right. been a joy for me. And as we as we close every show, when you lead in the age of personalization, you will see things that others don't do what others won't and keep pushing when prudence says quit. Thank you, Mark. God bless you and your family. Thank you so much. Mark. Thanks for listening to Personalization Outbreak. Make sure to subscribe so you never miss a show. If you enjoyed the content, visit ageofpersonalization.com to check out our free streaming video series and learn how to get involved in the movement. I'm Glenn Yopis. I wish you a good day. And remember, without strategy, change is merely substitution, not evolution.